ANMA Talks is an initiative for sharing knowledge between students, staff and management of the Nordic and Baltic Academies for Higher Music Education and anyone else interested. Welcome to this third edition, ANMA Talks The Roaring Twenties Internationalization Post-Corona. The session is moderated by Christopher Fredriksson. The smoke of the World War I had just settled. Europe and the world began to see the light again, and the time marked by an economic, social, artistic, and cultural dynamic knocked on the door, the Roaring Twenties. The period is often classified as a successful in the history of humanity, and in addition to the ex explosion of culture, this period was also marked by medical and scientific advances, as well as communication improvements. And how about now? Are we heading for the similar roaring 20s now, 100 years later? Even though we haven't reached the end of this pandemic yet, I think all of us at least start to feel some kind of optimist. We can see the light somewhere far away. The first time I heard the term the roaring 20s was actually in the Swedish radio a long time ago. There was this radio program called smoke rings. I was just a kid and the host, he was, his name was Leif Smoke Ring Andersson. And Leif, he always took this opportunity to express his bottomless disgust for modern jazz. He called it headache music. On the other hand, he spent the rest of the program to, to pay full tribute to the jazz music created during the Roaring Twenties and of course the following decades. And honestly, I don't remember so much of the music he played, a few names, but his voice has forever entered Swedish radio history and my memory. <clears throat> Leif, he had a throat disease as a kid, which uh, made his voice develop to something very, very special. And I also remember that he started each program with a phrase, good evening, music lovers. Welcome to this panel discussion, the Roaring Twenties, internationalization post-corona. Let me proudly present the band of today, a combination that cannot fail to please you. And so on. On drums, Stefan Gies, the CEO at AEC, on bass, the head of international office from Iceland, Alma Ragnarsdottir. On lead guitar, the one and only Petra Frank, Dean at Gothenburg University. And last but not least, on keyboard, and all the way from Estonia Academy of Music and Theater, Katarina Kitz. My name is Christoph Fredriksson. I work as International Relations Coordinator at Stockholm University of the Art. And I will guide you through these emerging 45 minutes with technical support by one of the organizers, the fabulous Camilla Overgaard. I hope you're there, Camilla, somewhere. I was supposed to, to talk like smoke ring, but I will lose my voice in two minutes. So, however, before we start this, I would like you to, to inform you about the Mentimeter. I think Camilla will post some kind of link and log in in the chat. Use your mobile, that's probably the easiest way. Later on, before we end, we will have some kind of check. Uh, we have prepared a question. But before that, you can also write, uh, if you have questions to the panel, please write it in the chat and we will try to catch up during this uh, 45 minutes. All right, time is not our friend today. Uh, so I will give the, the word to the, the panel. Very, very short from each of you. How do you interpret the title the Roaring Twenties, internationalization post-corona. So should we start with the drums? Stefan Gies, welcome to the panel. Okay, I try to say more than boom, boom. Uh, I mean, the reference to the Roaring Twenties uh, just reminds me that uh, it was about starting over after a crisis or even a system breakdown a hundred years ago. And this is uh, still the case today. Of course, hundred years ago, the system breakdown was by far much more serious than it is today. But the common point that really strikes me when thinking about the topic is that both events have led to a kind of polarization 
and opened up a huge gap between those who wanted to go back to the good old times and those who were open to innovation. And sure, these were roaring times. Uh, the new medium of radio came up uh, and from Sirius to new Vienna school and from Bauhaus to jazz, it was an incredibly inspiring time uh, for the art as a whole. But uh, you have also to think uh, there was also a movement inside music, which was reflecting this going back to the old times. The German speaking countries, it said, wir wollen unseren alten Kaiser wieder haben. We want our emperor back, which is reflected, uh, by the way, by the very, very popular at the time operetta, like from Leha and Kalman. And uh, this is about this gap. But the Rolling Twenties opened, so to say, uh, in their avant-garde session, also the door to fascism. And there is unfortunately still the danger that this will be repeated. Thank you, Stefan. Next to you on the screen is Petra. Petra, welcome. Thank you. Uh, well, pandemic is not new for the globe, but it's really new for me. Being head of a department, has this has really caused me the toughest period in my uh, time as a head. Uh, and you ask if this will be filled now with flourish of, of art and other things. Well, I beg and hope it will, because it's been tough. But I'm not an historian, so I don't really know, again, as Stefan said, we have seen from history before what have happened, what will happen this time. I guess we will see packed stadiums, crowded nightclubs and, and people wanting to be uh, taking part of art. But will this happen? Honestly, I don't know, because this is new for me. And we tend to have short memory as human beings. And therefore, I guess that we will go back and we discuss this a lot on our uh, department. What kind of education should we have? Are we doing the right thing by letting students in when there is no future on the other side when they come out right now? Or will there be, should we prepare for something totally crazy, as we saw from the Roaring Twenties, as you were uh, interpreting it, uh, Christopher? Uh, again, I don't know, but I have to follow and I try to, to be part of what's happening, but also to see that my department, my students and my staff can be part of also deciding where we go. So, so that's how we take it right now. So we beg and hope it will be great. Thank you, Petra. If there's someone in the audience who have this crystal ball in front of you, please share your, what you see in the chat. Alma, next, please. Yes, thank you. Well, you know, I always have a, a bit confusion around your titles, Christopher, but that's just me. <laughs> but anyway, you know, when I think about something roaring, you know, I, I you know, some loud noise came also to my mind and that kind of took me to the fact of digitalization all around us you know technology is just in our faces and we have to be online and you know digital all the time so you know, i would say you know that uh, this whole thing about digitalization has made us somehow move at a faster pace even though very much stuck in our physical locations we seem to be moving much faster and uh, when this happens you know that and you you are just coping with it these new realities and the fast pace new technologies um, somehow you tend to forget to just pause and think about you know the uh, the quality of things. So I think it's really important for us right now in internationalization and international collaboration to, to take this moment to pause and to really rethink and reshape our collaboration on, and, and you know how we, we are going to start things up again or continue as it has been in a possibly new way. Thank you, Alma. And talking about loud noises, what is the name of the volcano at the, that has erupted recently on Iceland? We always have strange names. What is the name of it? Well, you don't have just one volcano and one name. Uh, the, the initial one was uh, Fagradalsfjall, uh, but we'll see. There, there will be lots more. It's just Thank starting. You. Thank you. So, Katarina, how do you interpret the title, please? 
Hello, very nice to meet you all. Thank you. Uh, for me, as a student and a musician, it's uh, it has been very rough times and very interesting times. And I have been thinking a lot about uh, digitalization in the world. Like everything right now, everything in my world, in everyone else's world, is online, most of the things. But uh, we can't forget that the, the digitalized uh, world is like it's the biggest it's the biggest dead power in kind in some kinds because um, uh, for me for for instance arts arts and culture they uh, they need uh, the power of nature they they need the i don't know the human contact the inspiration with with which comes from the nature which uh, comes from the real things and for me uh, we can, we can uh, somehow we can um, be with our things in the in online, but it's very hard to uh, to live like that for a long time because uh, I'm I'm in luck of motivation and I'm in lack of inspiration because this doesn't inspire me when I see things happening behind the screens. So I think it's very important for humans to still have human contact. This is the things which came in, in my mind thinking about the topic. Yeah. Thank you. Let, let's stay in Estonia, Katarina. The, uh, I'm sure we will return to the the topics that have been mentioned so far, but uh, uh, do you believe we are facing the roar of the 20s, like 100 years ago after the First World War? Are we, are we, when this pandemic fades out sooner or later, and hopefully soon, are we, are we looking to some glory days again? Or what is your thoughts? Uh, I think um, I'm not sure if it will happen because uh, right now we don't we don't know what will happen after two days we don't know what will happen after two months so um, it really depends on I don't know what but uh, we the only thing which I think which we can do is to wait and hope I'm not I don't I, I don't have another big opinion about it. Katra, you were smiling. What are you? How do you? No, uh, but Katha is Katha is telling what my students are saying also. So what I, I, you wrote, you asked us to put the feelings. I mean, of course, the feelings now is a lot of hopelessness. Students are wondering what future they're facing, and as you said, Katha, this is no motivation, and and it's a tough time, uh, and. We all ask ourselves, will there be an audience? Will art have a greater role in society than it has had this time? I mean, we can see now how easy they could shut down, uh, shut down a whole industry. I mean, that's been a bit scary to see. And of course, then we must ask, uh, will we have a future? Will there be job? Unemployment among uh, uh, musicians and artists is huge in Sweden. And we also see a lot of people leaving the profession and retraining to new professions. Uh, so it's an extremely challenging period I think we're in. Uh, and, but of course, uh, there are also positive things, which I guess you want me to talk about, uh, Christopher. This is not to, to be a funeral. But digitalization has, of course, opened up new opportunities. We have seen that with, we have done a lot of live stream. We have reached out to so many people also outside Sweden and of course students are teachers we are looking who is there how many and you get so caught in how many clips and 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 sharing it's been and this has been inspiring and we ask ourselves can this create a new audience will these people who now sit at home eating popcorn or taking a beer will they also want to come to the concert hall or do we need to think new uh, do they want the popcorn and the beer and the live concert or uh, and other things? Do we have to do digitalization in 
before people come to the concert or afterwards do you want to have a, a music group i mean so there's a lot of things how can we continue to to develop both pedagogical methods and technology that enable uh, even more interactivity with the audience i think that is really uh, interesting but i must say also my students think a lot about how to get sustainable in the art but also the climate issue. Do we now have a, a, a possibility to make big, nice changes that also make us being the ones driving the climate change? I mean, we can see that uh, music and art really talk to people's feeling. It does a lot of other things also, of course. But can we use this in the challenge to make people feel and understand the facts that we get about climate changes and therefore push them to be more active and really wanting to be part together with the rest of us to change the big climate issue? This is a question that are erosion really tough by uh, among my students in this time also in the pandemic which is for me a bit change uh, strange that it came up uh, because we are changing i mean the whole digitalization you have to stay a lot at home you can only be at campus sometimes but the climate issue is something they want to to address with me also so uh, I hope that, uh, uh, I don't know, I agree with Alma that title is, uh, <laughs> my students don't think about the Roaring Twenties, I think, but the title is a bit annoying and inspiring. So I have, of course, read a lot before this now about different kind of, of uh, uh, thoughts, if this will happen now. So I think it's interesting, but I have no answer. Thank you, Petra. Alma. Along with the tourist sector, culture and creative sectors are among the most affected by the current crisis. We all know that. Uh, many professions uh, uh, can be digitalized and robotized, but the audience wants to see human performance. They want to identify themselves with the performance, uh, performer and they want to think that something can go wrong and so on. Could this represent a competitive advantage for the art professionals. Will, will culture be the winner in this post-pandemic world? What do you think, Alma? Well, I, I don't know. I was hoping you would not ask me about that particular okay. question. Oh. But, uh, but I mean, obviously, none of us might have a, a crystal clear answer on that. But I think we are seeing kind of the same things within culture, within education within international collaboration that we are just at a, a turning point where we don't really know what will happen next. And when we talk about post-COVID, post-pandemic, when, when will that be? You know, when, when will we be able to step out of this situation? And then, you know, the next uh, challenge, which is kind of all around us is, of course, climate change. So, so somehow this is all seems to be interlinked a little like Petra was saying. And I think it's very much about adapting to the new reality and this new space. We, we are all in, in, in two places at the same time. We are in a physical space with my barking dog that I not, now got rid of. And, uh, and we, we are in, within the digital space every day. So uh, in, to my opinion, nothing will be the same again, no matter if we talk about uh, mobility of students going from one physical location to another, whether it be a virtual one and, and the same a little bit with culture and, and how we engage with culture. Th there mm -hmm. will be maybe some new things that we do online, which are cultural engagements and creativity, but hopefully we'll, we'll get back to that scene of, you know, being jumping in the crowd celebrating yeah. our best loved mu musicians do you agree on that stefan will you also jump be jumping in a few years from now in the crowd what do you think uh, i i think it's it's a bit too early to uh, i mean i do not want to speculate but what what is what, what i also heard from the other speakers is and i totally agree that there is uh, I, I would say i do not even know if it's a tension but there are two sides the one is there is of course this longing to go back to a, to uh, 
experienced um, a concert together with other people that that longing for human contact uh, which which we are, have been lacking so so long and on the other side there's also that we discovered the huge potential uh, with all that digital uh, communication and, and digital things that are there and i think um, if, if you talk about culture as, as the winner of the whole thing i think there are certainly forms of social gathering that simply cannot be digitized uh, and I, in, in terms of uh, music events musical events i would think for example these kind of uh, big rock festivals uh, and for them the gathering is uh, just crucial maybe more crucial than for a small jazz club and for the opera it's being together more crucial than listening to a symphony uh, concert but i don't think that culture will come out on the winning road if at all all by itself and that's something i would to add to what has been said i think it's not sufficient just to to watch and observe what's going on and then we'll see we do not know how how it turns out but i think at a certain moment culture and cultural actors have to proactively work for that if it's to be successful that that means if you just sit there and and watching what's going on that might be the bad choice thank you camilla do we have something in the chat yes we do we have a question that is Take what, one question from yeah yeah please. what would be the central focus points to secure internationalization in music studies in the coming years mm -hmm. Everybody, what would be the central focus point? One, anyone wants to say a few words about that? Katarina, maybe. You're unfortunately muted, so please. Can you reply the question once more, please? What would be the central focus points to secure internationalization in music studies in the coming years? Uh, I think. Uh, the most important thing right now would be, in my opinion, to uh, be as much online as possible. Because right now I have seen my teachers have uh, created like I don't know websites to be online to create, to have master classes with students to uh, to share interesting interviews about uh, with with very interesting musicians and to there is many things which people really want to share and really want to there's so many things which uh, musicians uh, can do online we can uh, be we, we can edu educate ourselves online we can uh, th I, th I think uh, the biggest thing which we can do online is to educate because in my opinion uh, we can't i can't work online but i can educate myself online so this is very uh, important to take advantage of this education. Petra wants to say something. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Petra. Yeah, I agree. But I also want to say, I agree with, with Stefan who said that we have to pay, take a leading part of the changes we want to see. And, and for me, internationalization is also the possibility uh, for students and teachers and professors to meet across national borders. And I think that's very important. We've seen with the COVID, with the vaccine, how is solidarity brought out to the world or protection? So I think here it, we should keep on let our students and, and teachers and professors tell that knowledge is something we share uh, over national borders. Uh, and I also think that when we, when we have seen when students return home from uh, being out in, in, on an international stay, they have often gained so many new perspectives uh, that br they bring him to themselves, but also to, to the group, to the teachers, and uh, ideas about the music and what they met there. So, so I think it's very valuable to remember that internationalization on spot is also very important. I do agree that we should do more in digital thing. I mean, to bring a professor from New York, he, he or she doesn't need to come. It can be online, uh, but we also, so we, I think we will have more thoughts about when do we go abroad and when do we mo do mo uh, meetings like this. We should uh, make them both very important in, in the future, I think. 
before I let Stefan uh, give a comment on that one, Camilla, have you prepared the Mentimeter? Yes. The Great. Minute you so say go, we're ready. Stefan, uh, comment, and then we take the Mentimeter question. Please, Stefan. Uh, yeah, just I just wanted to add what what uh, Petra said. I think internationalization will be easier in future. But just if, if you think about you know these usual uh, what we are used to a uh, one semester stay abroad with your Erasmus things like that. I think this will continue to exist and it will certainly be not be replaced by an online Erasmus semester because it, it wouldn't make any sense to let's say to have an, uh, to go from Stockholm to to Rome for one semester and have your cappuccino and pizza in a pizzeria in Stockholm. And uh, this flavor will, and the need of, of getting the flavor will still be there, but it will be much easier to keep up the connections that you made during the stay abroad, uh, and even to prepare things, you know, and to stay in contact online. And this is an added value. It's just an added value, not hurting everything or destroying everything that has been for. And I think at, at, the, at the bottom line, this will make international mobility both more efficient and more attractive. Thank you. Camilla, I think it's time to launch the Mentimeter. And, and please, all of you who is listening to this session, open your mobile. Hopefully you have the, the, the app downloaded or otherwise you can go online. We will not spend hours on this one. So if you cannot connect, just watch the results sooner or later. However, if you go to this menti.com, there is a question. As you all know, the new Erasmus Plus program 2021-2027 has been launched. And for those of you who have read the four or 500 pages guide, have found out there are four priorities for the upcoming years. My question or our question is, if you should create or participate in an EU funded project, what priority would you choose? And you see the, the four alternatives. You can only choose one. So, and we can see how it on the screen that we have four votes so far, totally five. We give it a half a minute. This is extremely exciting. Okay, I think. Uh, we, we have a kind of clear tendency here. There won't be so big changes in this one, I guess. We have a clear, let's call it a winner, the inclusion and diversity. Uh, it's the far most popular. What I am a little bit surprised about is that only five uh, people voted on the active citizenship, at least before the pandemic, I attended a few conference and meeting and the engaged university and the active citizenship was on top of the agenda, of course, and in the coffee breaks, everybody talked about the climate change. Now they released the, the Erasmus program and the, uh, the subtitle is inclusion and diversity. I think we can uh, leave the, the shared screen, Camilla. Thank you for that. Thank you for all who voted. Uh, uh, some comments. Alma, why do you think only five people voted on the active citizenship? I think maybe, you know, this uh, terminology may not be clear to everyone what it means, what it entails. Uh, it, it may vary a little bit, you know, how much on the top of the agenda this is within institutions and even within countries. So that's my first response. Uh, mm. I, I myself, I voted for the inclusion and diversity because I think that is really a key and, and uh, with the new Erasmus program coming up with, with new opportunities, um, high funding and uh, the digitalization aspect, I think this question that came up earlier, I don't think we have to worry about uh, getting on track again in international collaboration. I think we're going to see huge expansion, like Stefan was saying. We, we're simply going to be doing new things together yeah. and, and we'll be able to address all of these goals within those activities, I think. Thank you. 
Anyone else who wants to comment the result in the panel? Uh, we have a bunch of questions in the chat, I see, but I, I will uh, ask one before we, we, we take something from the chat. Uh, Petra, will COVID-19 have a lasting impact on internationalization, do you think? We touched upon it, but uh, uh, before you answer, uh, there was a launch in, 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 on, uh, by the Swedish National Agency of the Erasmus program, and our Minister of Education gave a 20-minute speech, and she was very clear that uh, separate internationalization and climate change. It's not the same thing. They might be linked to each other at some point, but it's not the same thing. We have to be aware of this. Uh, I'm not saying you're going to comment my comment or the minister's comment, but what do you think about the um, uh, lasting impact of internationalization? But what I and, and Stefan and I think Alma also touched it, it I, I, I really believe it will continue. And, and of course, why our minister said that, uh, the Erasmus person said that is because I think I get this question from my student. We don't want to take uh, the flight. We want to take the train. So people are start to discuss other ways to make less impact on climate, but not and that they don't want to be uh, uh, going on Erasmus uh, exchange. And as also we see, uh, I don't know, but Sweden, to Sweden, there's a lot of students, especially on the master program, who wants to come and study in Sweden. I don't know if it's because we didn't lock down totally. I hope it was not. I hope there is something they find very interesting in the way uh, we teach. Uh, because what we have learned from this, uh, a pandemic situation with a lot of digitalization is also that we need to look over our uh, pedagogical uh, uh, skills. I mean, students are far more <laughs> advanced on being on the social platforms. And as you said, Kata, I can learn a lot from internet and so on. Well, why do we then need the teachers and the university? So we need to dig in. This is the opportunity to really take the next step on how to, to, to be working together with students and, and develop new teaching in, in the university. So I think there is a lot of interesting things to do together internationalized. And because I think a lot of different countries have, have their best practice and we need to share that a lot. Uh, so therefore I think also we have we, we talk a lot about the students mobility I think we need even more around the uh, teachers and professor because we see that that's not happening so much and especially when they come back how do we use that new knowledge and information to develop our own programs and, and my institution for example so yes I believe internationalization will continue Thank you. Stefan, I, I, I guess I presume that you have met more or less all the rectors and head of different departments around Europe in the position as CEO at AEC. How, what would you advise them, uh, the rectors, how can the universities promote internationalization in the post-corona time? What would be your advice to these guys? Uh, I mean, uh, the first thing I would give advice is to equip their institutions with a uh, proper means uh, in order to to use all this kind of, of digital means. Uh, that means also, I mean, uh, to have high speed connections and, and use LOLAR and these kind of things, which are really beneficial. Uh, and that enables maybe even institutions that before the pandemic have been a little bit lost out somewhere in the countryside. Uh, to get them closer uh, or, or on, a, on, a, on an equal level with, with other uh, institutions that are never had uh, any, any problems with being uh, well connected over, all over the world. Um, that's the first thing I would say, but and, and based on this, I think, uh, I think, I don't think that traveling will stop. And I don't even think that it makes sense. Uh, and maybe we should also imagine a little bit things like in 2050, there will be airplanes which uh, zero or very low carbon uh, out output or things like that. I mean, that's, that's the things we do not think about today. We just think about how to improve things as they are technically today. 
But I think uh, what we learned, for example, through the pandemic is also in terms of, of traveling and of the, the environment uh, issue uh, combined with traveling is that there are still things we can do immediately. For example, I find it great that maybe triggered by the pandemic, suddenly all these night trains pop up again, which have been shut down 10 or 15 years ago. And things like that, I think, as an overall combination, should enable us to really um, to further exchange on an international level without any damage or what, whatever, but with different means. Mm. I, I can also add one little, a small thing. Yes, please. I, yeah, I think it's very important also to increase the uh, uh, amount of p teachers who teach in English in our university and to have a competence in the intercultural communication. I think that's necessary for developing our globe and climate changes issues also. Uh, Alma, you're head of the international office on Iceland. What, how are, what are you talking about in the coffee breaks and what is your strategic plan for the internationalization in the post-COVID world? Um, I mean, currently um, the international office is, is leading a discussion on, you know, how to make the best use of these new opportunities within Erasmus, which is the all these different mobility options of uh, blended mobility, you know, this online feature before or after physical mobility, the semester exchanges, you know, th this has always been the big thing in Erasmus. I think we will now start to see much more mobility around blended options and maybe in the near future also virtual mobility, you know, that, that we will be more generous in terms of doing courses together online or simply sharing our lectures or or you know our education and i think students also in the future they will be uh, looking at this when choosing their education that they will want to go to a university that is um, that has uh, partnerships around sharing knowledge and and which offers precisely these opportunities that you will be able to be a little bit flexible in your studies to select your courses and not all of these courses are offered by your home university but but it's partners so i really think that um you know that there is so much ahead of us you know so many opportunities and um, there's just going to be uh, it's going to be blooming, I think, in, in that sense. But but we definitely, as Petra was saying and Stefan, I mean, we need to consider staff training. So if we consider the impact of virtual mobility versus the physical one as, as having the same goals in itself, that this will enhance certain skills of students uh, in order for that to happen, we need how to offer courses online, how to do teaching online, how to uh, allow students to collaborate online within online courses and virtual mobility. So, so we really have to put some effort and uh, investment into that. And, but I feel some optimism here, and that's that I like, really. Uh, we are soon uh, done with this session, uh, but uh, Camilla, do we have something interesting in the chat that we could share? Yes, there is a direct question for Katharina. I see. What Perfect. is the first international move you want to do when the world opens up again? Uh, actually, uh, to be true, I'm moving quite a lot right now. <laughs> like um, uh, two weeks ago, I was in Italy. So next week, I will go back to Estonia and then I will fly to Italy again on 4th of May. But it's because um, if you travel by car, it's uh, kind of possible to not be in quarantine. Uh, anyway, I mean, I'm anyway staying at home unless I'm having lessons in Italy, for, uh, for instance. But from the school in Italy, I had the document paper, papers needed to, you know, to be, the travel to be possible. So actually, <laughs> as funny as it is, I'm uh, traveling quite a lot right now. So <laughs> it's good. <laughs> I'm, I feel very pleased with this discussion. I would like to thank Alma, Petra, Stefan and Katarina 
so much about your for your input for this topic. Thank you. Thank you.